really want to ask you like a, about some of your work because we've looked into it a little bit, but a lot of it is like kind of beyond us to be honest, uh, since I think you've been studying it for so long uh, that it's really quite complex. But we wanted to first like ask if you could introduce yourself a little bit more generally. Yeah, absolutely. Let's see. I'm a philosopher of education, uh, and that kind of happened because I'm also what's called a high achieving dyslexic. So when I was in school, uh, I didn't quite fit in and specifically felt that the standardized testing in particular, I just had a big problem with it because of my dyslexia it made, made me basically perform terribly on standardized tests, even though in other situations in class, when I was talking, or even when I was writing, if I had a spell checker and like a nice setup. I performed well, uh, and so I just started thinking about the educational system at a young age. Essentially, studied uh, uh, educational neuroscience and cognitive developmental psychology. Tried to make a better form of standardized educational assessment that would be more fair, that would be scientifically grounded, um, and then through that, looking at educational systems. Uh, I became very concerned about the nature of civilization itself right now in this moment of great crisis. Mm. So I became concerned mm. about some of the most consequential issues in our civilization. Uh, one of them is actually education. <laughs> and needing to, to really fundamentally think education. Uh, but because I didn't do well as a musician where I was a scholar, so I just kind of saved my self-esteem in high school by playing music and not identifying my academic achievement. Uh, it was a few months later that I, that I did that. And so I still play sometimes. Uh, what else? I meditate a lot. I've been practicing Zen meditation for 20 years or so. Uh, and also I've been involved in a lot of conversations about the future of religion uh, and in the context of my work as a psychologist, engaging with people like Ken Wilber and others and these big conversations about the future of religion and how that's relevant to education and how that's relevant to civilization. So that would be my take <laughs> on that. That's, I mean, that's amazing. Very impressive. Um, I feel like people usually at least in my experience, they, they, people discuss like reforming education, but the way that it's usually reformed is just back into the same old cycle. Like it feels like there's never, at least like in my time when I've been at school, there's never been a radical enough change to education um, to fill some of those gaps that I feel like exist. But I, I think it's like very interesting and kind of important work that you're doing, I would say, in my view. Uh, but, Sophia, do you want to introduce yourself first, or should I? Um, I can start. So, uh, my name is Sophia. Uh, Jan and I were both DP students at the International School of Prague. And um, I'm very interested in language and literature. And in fact, um, recently, or earlier, uh, I suppose last year at this point, um, we participated in uh, TEDx and delivered a talk about language as a vehicle of human resilience. Um, but yes, I've lived here and also um, around Asia a bit, and I'm very happy to be here talking to you. I'm Jana, and as Sophia said, I am also a DP student, and um, my interests mostly lie in the arts these days. It started off as science, but then I realized I don't have the mathematical capability necessarily uh, needed for like high level scientific thinking. So I kind of switched to the arts a little. Not saying that arts is, you know, less intellectual than sciences because I, I wouldn't believe that, but um, that's my main passion right now. And uh, I've actually also done a TEDx talk that kind of connects to some of what your research is, I think. And it was about the overview effect, which I don't know if you know about the overview effect, but it's what happens to a human being's brain when they go to space. And it turns out that it's 
that specific phenomenon is like very connected to what to like global mindedness and what the IB I think tries to do with education uh, and anyways that's yeah <laughs> it's great to talk to you guys in Prague uh, I have a connection to uh, kind of the Czech people through Amos Comenius John Amos Comenius <clears throat> who have done a lot of work on him uh, and similarly, as I was just saying, he was one of those people who saw education as foundational to civilization itself, um, which is true. Uh, and he had to do very rapid <laughs> in education. And so do very, actually, that's another, it's a longer conversation. Um, well, uh, if we, you mentioned Comenius, and so if we were to start there, uh, where would you find that your pedagogical views intersect with his? So just for context, everybody who might be listening, John Amos Comenius was a uh, philosopher, bishop, theologian, peace activist, institution founder, uh, refugee um, in the 16th, 17th century in Europe, <clears throat> from the, originally in what we would now call the Czech Republic, um, which was then known as Bohemia. Uh, and so he was there during the 30s which you guys probably know about. Most Americans don't really know about the Thirty Years' War, but I would imagine in Europe about the Thirty Years' War, which was a catastrophic event uh, and a transition between two very different types of civilizations, one being a feudal system, uh, feudal systems with government run by the divine right of kings and uh, all kinds of things that we would now look on with a great deal of suspicion. And then what we now think of as modernity and capitalism, the 30 years war was a transition point between those two fundamental systems. And uh, Comenius was there <laughs> on the scene. Um, and he was the first person to recommend, for example, not beating kids if they got answers wrong, like literally like <laughs> physical violence. He recommended that was about it. He was the first person to recommend that education should be offered in people's native language as opposed to Latin. So you have to understand that the feudal system, education was primarily religious or the guild systems. Most people were completely illiterate. Uh, and education was cloistered in these religious contexts where they would speak basically only in Latin and only to a select number of people. This is in Europe. It was different in China and, of course, in other places. Um, so Comenius was the first person to envision a public education system where everyone who was born into the society got educated. He was the first person to have that idea. And in those days, this was an insane idea. Like people's brains were coming out of their ears when they heard him say this because education was specifically a thing that was kept out of access to the peasants. <laughs> uh, and of course, that was easy to do when there wasn't a printing press, but the printing press changed everything. You could easily mass produce texts. And if the peasants learned to read, and then, then what? Well, then what is the French Revolution and the American Revolution? <laughs> Uh, which, which Comenius, uh, you would, I would argue, was involved in the early beginnings of as an, as a, as a, as again, as an activist towards a new world order in which everyone had a right to education, including women, including people with disabilities. Um, uh, and so he was also the first person to envision something like an international body of scientific collaboration, uh, and a society that was um, explicitly multicultural and planetary. Now he was a Christian, but he believed that all of the peoples of the earth would find a way to be at peace together. He was the first person to recommend a universal language as a way to resolve that, meaning that everyone would speak one language. So his most famous book, the Orbis Pictus, was the first children's book first kid's picture book ever, very famous book, uh, was in print for 400 years. <laughs> and like not as a novelty, like in print and used for 400 years. Uh, also his book, The Gateway to Language, similarly reprinted for the same reason, because it was an incredible instructional technology where he put your native language next to Latin under a picture. So get that the page is a picture at the top, there's two text columns, one's in Latin, one's in English. 
And it just allowed people to learn Latin and it allowed people to learn their own language because the picture demonstrated what the words were. Um, and this was the first time a book had ever been created like this. We take this for granted that you have something like a textbook that has images and graphics and things and you learn from it. But he was the first guy to do that. And that thing swept the, the country, excuse me, swept Europe. Um, so he became very famous. Uh, and then went to Sweden, went to England, went to Transylvania, went back to Bohemia, all attempting to essentially reform their education systems into what we would call a modern education system. Um, he also believed that instructional techniques had to be customized to each unique individual and that they should be understood in terms of the development of their competencies and personalities. So he didn't, th so prior to that, everyone was basically instructed as if they were an adult, <laughs> which for some very precocious kids was awesome. But for most kids was a nightmare because you would get beaten if you got the answer wrong. So that's just not good. He was suggesting that instead uh, you realize that a three-year-old is different from a seven-year-old is different from a 17-year-old is different from a 27-year-old, that these are very distinct and they should be approached in very distinct ways. He was one of the first people to articulate that idea. Um, so this is me just laying out this kind of world historical figure in the philosophy of education. Um, and so, yeah, in, in many ways, the, so the broader point I was trying to make is that he stood between two worlds. He stood between the feudal system and what we call the modern system. Uh, and he believed education was a fulcrum between these two new systems. Like it was a transition point. It was a, it was a bridge between the two world systems. Um, and so in the broadest terms, my book, Education in a Time Between Worlds, is arguing that we are now again in that space between two world systems and that education is a bridge between two distinct world systems. We are exiting the system that Comenius was entering, which is the modern system, the modern capitalist kind of like nation state system. What's emerging is something completely new based on digital technologies, a new form of international cooperation in the face of global crisis uh, and a new emerging uh, world culture, world planetary culture. Uh, so I write a lot about that. So in that sense, that's how I am cl most closely identified with Comenius is that recognition that education plays an extremely important role in a historical time when you're between two worlds, which is something that he recognized specifically. And so I believe we're in that, we're in that time, um, which is very exciting for you guys, actually. <laughs> uh, maybe a little daunting, maybe a little daunting, but it's very exciting because the, the world 10, 20 years from now is gonna be very, very fundamentally different than it is now. And it could be, it could be markedly qualitatively better um, could be worse, <laughs> but it could be better. And a lot of that depends on how your generation steps into responsibility um, and how they uh, kind of take control of the tools of the digital as opposed to being controlled by the digital. That's This is the risk. Mm. Uh, so anyway, so that's a little bit of reflection on Comenius, who's a fascinating character. And I wrote a paper that was published on Perspectiva, which is a UK think tank. Uh, it's just called Education Must Make History Again. And it's just about John Amos Comenius. So you can kind of really get into some, some detail there. Uh, he's on the Czech currency, I think, if I'm not mistaken. But I, I may be out of date now. That's really interesting. First of all, I would actually really like to read that paper if I can somehow get to it that'd be awesome because uh, I think he's a pretty interesting character too and I was um, I say forced to but I enjoyed it uh, to learn a lot about him during like my Czech culture history lessons because so awesome like I, I went all the way through American education and then to graduate school to study education and never heard him mentioned once um, and yeah so good yeah, us Czech people, we really like our own history. You know, we're kind of bad at teaching other countries' history. Like, I don't think I learned almost any American history, but I know a lot, a lot about Kominsky, so there's that. <laughs> but it's, it's, you know, it's nice. But I do have some kind of questions, or there's some things that, bring, that that all brings up for me. And the first one is about this idea of, like, 
kind of a global consensus or like a global like international cooperation and I'm wondering I'm going to try to phrase this in a good way like a coherent way is there a way to make our world like really globally minded because I think about all of the different things that we learn or all of the different cultural elements of our world that are very specific to particular cultures. And I'm trying to figure how we might become as a world <laughs> globally minded, like how we might come to some kind of consensus about all these different things that are like inherently so different for each culture. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible for us to become like really globally minded and do you even think it's like something that we should aspire to? A reasonable question, uh, especially given the failures of what I might call globalization, which was uh, economic policy uh, that wrapped around the world, spread out from the Western nations. It was mostly exploitative um, and extractive. Uh, so it makes us skeptical of the global. Um, but what I would call planetization Planetization is an inevitability of the fact that the Earth is a sphere and we keep multiplying. If the Earth was actually an infinite plane, we would just keep spreading out <laughs> and then we wouldn't have to deal with each other. But because the Earth is a sphere, geometrically, if we keep reproducing, uh, we will inevitably have to come to terms with what could be called our species consciousness. Um, now, that should 100% not sub subordinate or homo make homogenous or like make into everything being the same the local the local needs to stay distinct so it's a kind of a tension and a polarity between those issues that can only be addressed at planetary scale like climate change uh, and other what are sometimes called global catastrophic risks which are just like really bad things that everyone has a vested interest in not happening like everyone <laughs> doesn't want that to happen uh, and that's one way to frame it is that there's a very minimal set of things that everyone can kind of agree on. One of them is that we all want to survive. Um, and so it used to be that clans could fight and things could happen and it wouldn't affect people on the other side of the planet. They didn't even know that it was happening. But now we're so completely interconnected that just those bare minimum desire to not die actually requires us to cooperate now at this point in history. Um, no single country can solve climate change. No single country can solve nuclear uh, war. Um, no single country can solve a whole bunch of these issues. So there's a kind of need for planetary scale cooperation. So there's that need, but there's a risk that that will destroy the uniqueness of specific places and what needs to be brought. And so that is one of those things that we are, have been dealing with for a very long time. Well, not a very long time, but almost a century, um, which is that as this thing we've been calling in this conversation already modernity <laughs> uh, <clears throat> spread around the world, um, we were faced with that. And that was, again, electric communication, high-speed travel, right? Uh, international supply chains for commodities and international finance exchange. All this saying that we are inevitably now unified as a, as a planet. The question is what we do culturally with that and educationally with that. Um, and, uh, so it's a deep question. You're pointing to a very real tension. Like we should be very skeptical of scary plans for a world government. Like let's not have a single world government. Like that's a bad idea, but we should also be skeptical of people saying that, well, let's retreat into our cultures. Let's retreat into our nations and not aspire to coordination. Because if we do that, then we all will die. <laughs> Because there literally are problems that, that can only be solved through international cooperation. Um, and again, cooperation doesn't mean consensus. And it doesn't mean that we all believe the same things. We're actually looking for an overlapping small set of basic ethical agreements that will allow us to continue to survive as a species. 
uh, and that was never possible before. Globalization was forced upon the third world by people trying to make money. Uh, now we're being called to planetary consciousness. We're being called to a kind of global citizenship um, by the nature of the problems that our civilization has created for itself, like climate change, for example, or the fragility of the economic and supply chains, which we saw with COVID. COVID is a great example of the need for international cooperation. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so I'm, I'm with you. Like, whoa, 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 slow down. <laughs> like everything's so unique. And yet here we are, you're in Prague, I'm in the United States, and we're instantaneously communicating electrically, right? So it's like we are inevitably, inexorably planetary now. The question is how our culture keeps up with that. And um, yeah, there are totally better and worse ways for that to go. I just have one thing to add and then please go on. Uh, what I wanted to say is that this is like remarkably similar to what the overview effect does to people because um, essentially yeah, what it gives them is this like massive sense of perspective. So immediately mm -hmm. they feel that there's something like bigger to work towards and it isn't just about their culture or their family or even just like their own self. But in fact, there is just this floating rock in space on which we all live and we have to somehow like yeah deal with that <laughs> even if uh, the geometry of the planet requires it like and it's pretty easy to think the earth is just an endless horizontal plane when you're standing here <laughs> you like go up on a mountain and it actually appears that way but unless you're from space and in fact that first photograph i'm sure you know this that first photograph that was sent back you know the, the first photograph that was that it just it was actually shocking to see um so yeah, and that wasn't that long ago. That was whatever it was in the 60s, right? So it hasn't been that long since planetary consciousness has even been available. Um, so so yeah, there's a lot of that. And I see that fundamentally as an educational problem. The difference between a kind of negative, extractive, self-destroying globalization and like a positive, creative, sustainable planetization hinges on education. I would argue, and what we do with technology, but so that's more to that, but please, Sophia. Oh, thank you. Um, I wanted to go back to that. So talking about this essential and inevitable interconnectedness, and also going back to how we're speaking right now, which is through, through technology, right. through a, a screen, uh, what do you think growing with technology entails? Because I remember, uh, a few minutes ago, you were also saying how, well, who is controlling what and to what extent, how is that dynamic going to work out and how does it exist currently? And uh, so do you think technology could or will outgrow us? And yes, that's what I was wondering. What do you, that's a very good phrase. What do you mean by technology would outgrow us? Can you say more about that? I think, well, there's a, the, the first thing I think of is AI in the sense that we are creating this, to me, unfathomably just incredible thing. It's miraculous, really, to have something that creates within limitations, of course, but that, that creates independently, in a sense, with input from others. But it's, it's able to, in some small sense, exist without help, without us. And I think as technology continues to improve and evolve and perhaps we're slightly at that point already with the way that we're very 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 much some of us involved in for example social media or i don't know just just different forms of technology that has it outgrown us already has it kind of gone beyond our control this is a great question and it's relevant to Comenius, right because again Comenius is actually grappling with the consequences of the printing press, like the, the Reformation, right, if you will, which is the Protestant, you know, emerging out of Catholicism, had a lot to do with the ability just to print Bibles for people. And we think printing press, we don't think advanced technology, but in those days, a printing press was like an advanced technology. Like if you had a printing press, you had to defend it with guns. Like it was, so valuable and it was actually intricate engineering feat uh, to do the ones that could produce things at scale. So one of the questions Communist was asking is how, how do you responsibly use a printing press? 
which is another way of saying who owns the printing press. If just the king and the pope own the printing press, then what? Right. So Comenius actually went out of his way to get aristocrats to buy him printing presses so that he could create textbooks that would counteract the propaganda coming from the kings and the popes. So similarly, and it was fundamentally changed culture, the availability of these texts. So right now we're in a similar situation, which is who controls these technologies um, that are becoming really fundamental to socialization and political power and identity and information, communication, who controls these, uh, who builds them and for what purpose, right? Um, and deeper in that question is this question that you're getting at, which is, is there possibly even something distinct about digital technology that we could get what's called a sorcerer's apprentice problem, right? Which is that we create something <laughs> that actually we don't completely understand and can't actually control. Um, and so both of those are very interesting, which is to say, okay, who actually builds Facebook and TikTok and these platforms and what are their interests and what are they actually trying to do? And what would be a better way to design these things? Um, what is an optimal educational technology actually like that really uses the potentials of what the digital can do? Um, uh, and I like to think about that as basically a very simple design principle for education technology that makes sure we never get in trouble, uh, which is that an educational technology should always maximize the benefit of human relationship rather than make human relationships seem more boring than what's happening on your screen or in your augmented reality glasses. Right. So this is key because most educational technology is trying to have you look at your screen for longer and longer and longer. <laughs> um, like Khan Academy, you just watch the videos and then you do things and you take things and you're chatting with people and that kind of stuff. Um, what I'm saying is that no, we don't want to get into a situation where the, the technology is more interesting than people. We need the technology to remind us of how amazing people are and arrange for us the perfect conversations to be having with exactly the right people about exactly the right stuff and exactly the right time for us. Um, so there's a potentiality in what I think will be coming, what I call AI tutoring systems, where an AI is used to educate kids, um, which could go horribly wrong, <laughs> uh, which would make all the teachers useless and even parents useless because this AI is so much more captivating and entertaining and knows how to talk to you and knows everything about you. Right. Um, so I believe that we should never have educational technologies that keep us away from people and focused on the technology that it should always point us back to people, show us and help us relate to people more give us the materials to have conversations and do experiments and do pop-up classrooms and other things, as opposed to just have kids sitting alone looking at screens. Right? So that's, that's step number one. Step number two is uh, the AI. And so this is very, there's AI is one of the most important things that's occurring right now. So when we think about this time between worlds notion, um, AI is one of the things that makes the world that we're going to be entering very fundamentally different from this world. And, um, you know, in, like, as I said, after I got through my work in, uh, standardized test reform, I started thinking about civilization in general and how civilizations work. How does this whole thing work and how can it go wrong uh, and how can it get better? Um, and so AI is right in there <laughs> as something that will either make things incredible, like much, much, much better, I believe. Uh, when done correctly, especially in the space of education. Um, and in my book, I write about the potentialities of the digital uh, to make for an educational renaissance, really. Um, but of course, there were, there were bad scenarios as well, where the AI tutors, um, again, supplant teachers and parents. And we actually have a generation, which wouldn't be your generation because you're already too old, a generation that has been fundamentally raised by machines not by humans. Um, so it's a science fiction thing now, but um, 
it's an important thing to think about the power of AI in the space of education as being very, uh, very game changing, very paradigm changing, as I say. With this potential technological renaissance, we're talking about, I assume, like a total paradigm shift in how we learn and what we learn, um, not only in school, but also just in our you know, youths and from our parents, however it may be. I'm wondering, like, is there any knowledge that will just never become obsolete? Because I know, let me like use a quick example if I can. Like in Czech schools, um, they have something called Škola v přírodě, and it's basically like a week where you have to learn in the forest. And it's just, they go learn like various things about the forest, and that's it. And I don't know of that many other cultures that do that, but to the Czech culture, it's like very, very important. And I'm wondering if knowledges like that, if they might be lost or kind of put on the back burner, if education becomes too focused on technology in the wrong sense, you know, because I, I, I think technology is very valuable, but I wonder if there's any knowledge that you think is just like mm -hmm. vital to keep. Really? I mean, I, I implicitly implied as much when I said that the technology should always bring us back to human to human relationship rather than take us out of it and into human machine relationship. Right. Um, and so that would be bad if we forgot how to relate to one another because we're mostly spending our time relating to a machine or relating to each other vicariously through a machine, right? So it's like uh, there are essentials of human relationship uh, that, what's the right word, make us human, which we can't forget. And edu education is one of those things. It's a species-specific trait, which is a fancy way of saying other animals don't do education. We do. Uh, and education is predicated upon youth and elder in mutually uh, respectful relationship and actually usually some kind of like affection and respect that education runs on a certain type of teacher-student relationship or elder-student relationship, which is deeply embodied and deeply in context of culture. Uh, Human-machine relationship is not like that at all. <laughs> um, to the extent that the machines get really fancy and start to simulate human conversation, then you get this, what's called the uncanny valley, where you approach this machine human relationship that uh, is, once you like, anyway, so you guys are familiar, like it's just, we're approaching a weird, <laughs> a weird scenario, uh, which is pretty uh, disconcerting. So that's a roundabout way of saying, yeah, knowledge about how humans should communicate and act towards one another, um, which isn't propositional knowledge. It's not a set of commandments. It's a learned, embodied, interactive capacity, sometimes uh, related to the attachment relationships to your parents, your internalized social schemas, your self-identity and self-esteem through all of this stuff. So it's like you have to you have to be socialized with other humans in embodied communicative context. You can't be socialized one on one machine. So that's very important. Um, in my work in thinking about the future of religion, I actually think there are some beliefs about the nature of the universe that uh, because they are true and constitutive of healthy human identity should not be lost. Um, and that's a deep thing I just said. I basically said like, there are certain things about the nature of the universe that we live in that we should never forget. And it should always strive to know. Um, and these are the kind of the highest wisdom that's offered by the religious traditions. Now, there are, of course, many bad problems with inherited pre-modern religious traditions. Uh, and modernity was mostly critical of the religious traditions, separating church and state. One of the things that characterizes the world we're moving into is a return of the importance of what would now be called spiritual, spirituality or religiosity as a fundamental issue in education. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I think there are some pretty deep truths and some of them, again, these two things are related. If you are truly in an embodied socialized context with other humans, 
the idea that a person is sacred, which is a very specific form of inviolability. So it's like, eh, there's a tree out there. I can chop it down if I want to, right? Maybe I can even eat a cow, right? Uh, but not a person. I'm not going to kill that person arbitrarily. Uh, and, and that there's a unique identity that the person has that's somehow valuable and completely distinct. Uh, you know, that's obvious. You don't have to be told that by a religion to come to have that respect for human dignity. You just have to be socialized in enough embodied contexts with enough psychologically healthy people. And then you just have, <laughs> you have that awareness. Um, and again, with the saturation of social media and the movement into many, many waking hours spent on screen as opposed to spent in embodied relationship, which is why I'm glad they're sending kids to the forest. <laughs> uh, so that we're just running that risk. And so the technolo technology I see is quiet and non-invasive. So you guys know what augmented reality is, right? So like right now we're mostly staring at screens. That's not going to be the case in about three or five years. We're mostly going to have augmented reality things, which will be like my glasses. Um, and then I could go out to the woods, for example, with a group of kids. And we all have these augmented reality glasses on. Uh, and it orchestrates us through a very beautiful set of experiments and conversations where it's monitoring each kid's reaction and saying, oh, you should actually talk to this kid over there. And it's kind of orchestrating a rich embodied socialized experience with minimally invasive little prompts <laughs> where you like look at a tree and you're like, what kind of tree is that? And it's like, well, you know, the tree is a pine. It's this gets a white pine. And you can tell that by the, by the five needles. And like, so you get that sense of it. You're not out there on your computer it actually reveals more of the world as opposed to taking you out of the world and reveals more social possibility and interaction than as opposed to disincentivizing that. Uh, and will be very, it, one of the, I don't know, I'm not going to go into that. There's a lot of things to think about with that future of education. That's the augmented reality based, uh, human intensive, um, education. Uh, but it's a necessity to get that right. It's a necessity to get that right. So that was a long answer and kind of a rambling answer, but yeah, there's a lot of knowledge that we can't lose. And that's a really good way to distill down the nature of the philosophy of education. Fundamentally, it's a question about what should we teach the next generation? You can't arbitrarily just say everything <laughs> uh, and you can't say nothing either. And there's a tendency when you're in a civilization that's faltering, where there's many crises and the adults don't seem to know what they're doing to say, well, we shouldn't pass on anything because we failed. Um, but you can't do that. There's actually the preservation of knowledge and capacity uh, is important, but there's discernment. There's discernment that's needed about what uh, should be included um, in the curriculum of the future. So, uh, Talking about this, this preservation, which I perked up when you mentioned it, because so much of what we're talking about and what you've discussed has so much to do with, well, preservation. What do we keep? What do we pass on? And going back to also those values, those whether it be preserving and maintaining interpersonal react, uh, not reactions, relationships in education, or whether it be those religious or universal truths that you were talking about earlier. I think any type of preservation is in a sense a limitation on something you're closing off that particular whether it be concept or or aspect from change and so do you think in the sense that we we must limit process or that we should yeah absolutely we should we have to in, in the arts there's actually and in writing uh there's kind of a principle which is you want to allow the form to set constraints on the creativity Right. So like if you write a sonnet or if you write a haiku, you are intentionally limiting your creativity into this form, which sometimes people find to be actually better than just open free form. And with music, this was also the case. Like if you, if you play a simple instrument, like a flute, that's it. That's all you got. If you're an electronic musician at a computer, <laughs> you've got 10,000 different or more probably infinite number of sounds that you can make. Um, so there's a principle there. Uh, and this is true in education. Um, 
when you get a child into a context of education, uh, you specifically create that context is, is both like a context where they exercise freedom, right? Where it's like, you want to create a space where they can be completely free, but in order for them to have that freedom and autonomy, you have to limit what's actually in the space. <laughs> right. Uh, and the simple examples with little kids, it's like, yeah, you create a playroom and they can just do whatever they want in their playroom. Cause there's no knives and matches in the playroom, right? There's just like soft things basically and toys that they can put in their mouth and not swallow. Uh, and then that same principle apply. You're trying to by through limitation, make possible possibility and freedom. Uh, so when you think about a curriculum, uh, for, you know, young adults, similarly, it's like you want to create a space where they can fully exercise autonomy in a way that will be beneficial. So the teacher kind of knows how to create that space, how to have the right conversations, which texts, when, you know, like which secondary sources, for what purpose are we doing this work? Um, and, uh, yeah, so, but that's that tension and they're, there's a, there's a tendency, at least for me as a philosopher, to want to try to include as much as possible in the curriculum of the future. Uh, and so that's what the internet does. Like Google is just everything. Like, um, so this question of, yeah, how do you responsibly narrow down what, what you put in front of people? How do you, how do you narrow it down? Uh, like you guys are hitting some deep tensions. Uh, and all I can say is there's no formula, right? It's discernment. Similarly, like with what you preserve, it's about judicious discernment, uh, through conversation. Um, so another great example is just grammar. This is a point that Noam Chomsky makes the great linguist, which is that like grammar is completely a limit on freedom. And yet there would be no conversation without grammar. So it's a limited rule set, which is actually quite small and specific, which generates infinite possibility. Um, so there's something there about that limitation that creates freedom. It's a, it's a paradox, right? Uh, John Dewey said something cause he was a constructivist educator. So John Dewey said something cause all the constructivists are just a bit, let the kids do whatever they want. How do you ever justify stopping them from doing something? Uh, and Dewey said, that limitation on freedom is allowed, which enables greater future freedom. So this is a deep point, which is the only way, the only time you can limit someone's freedom is if when you do that, you're actually making it so that in the future they have more freedom if, as if you hadn't do that. So like the kid doesn't want to learn math and he wants to go play outside. And so you're like, okay, kid, play outside for a little while. All right. But now you have to learn math. So I'm going to limit your freedom in the interest of you learning math. But I know <laughs> that when you're 15 or whatever, you will be way more open to doing way more stuff by virtue of having learned math now. Um, similar with acquisition of discipline and other things where it's like, I really don't want to do this. Why are you limiting my freedom? The only valid justification is I'm limiting your freedom because if you lock this in now, you will have more freedom later. If I don't limit your freedom now, you will actually top off. Like you will be incapacitated and you won't have the freedom that other people's have. Um, so that's another way to think about that constraint. You know, those constraints are valid, which actually create more through virtue of them being instantiated. That was very abstract, but I hope that's useful. Sorry. You know, this question that I'm about to ask might be like, way uh way too unforeseeable i suppose but i'm wondering i think that from what you were saying you and comenius both seem to see uh this like time that we're in this kind of limbo as like an opportunity for growth if i'm understanding it kind of right and so in that case <laughs> how do you think do you think we'll know when this limbo time is over? Like, will it be in the foreseeable future? Should we kind of revel in it or should we just try to get past it into like the kind of stable state that awaits us next, if that even exists? Like, what do you think of how this limbo time will continue? There are different opinions here. So I'm not just, a lot of what I say I get from 
my research. Uh, so I'm not the only one saying this. So there are several different what are called, you could call them meta historians or macro historians, people who look at very large quantitative trends in history. Um, and they see these cycles of crisis basically. Uh, and so some of them have very specific predictions <laughs> about like where we're at and when this thing will recalibrate. Um, uh, I don't have specific predictions and I don't have numbers. Um, but there are certain things and AI is one of them. The climate, the climate is another, and there's a few others, one economics where it's kind of like the clock is ticking. Um, that we either figure this out or it gets a lot worse very rapidly. And just being frank with you guys, because I think we'd be, to be honest with the next generation, <laughs> that we, that you know, I would say something like by 2050, uh, some very significant things have had to be solved. AI is one of them, I believe. Um, uh, that by, uh, and so that's like one way to think about it. Um, but another way to think about it is that, uh, we, and I'm including you guys in the, we, uh, and I don't know exactly how old you are, but it's like, there's that sense of like, we're mostly going to be living in a transitional period. Um, and that's amazing opportunity, right? So there's, there's near term work that needs to be done with the existing institutions just to make them better than they could be. If we did nothing, we call it just mitigating the worst of it right now, like near term triage, like just trying to patch up the boat, you know, but then there's this work in the transition where literally what you're doing is not trying to fix the old institutions, but trying to build a fundamentally new kind of institution. Um, that's this transitional work. And then there's the work of living in that future civilization, which will restabilize at a planetary level within planetary boundaries that, you know, is humane. Ideally. So in perpetuity, we've created a civilization that is actually humane and that is sustainable and that will self terminate. There's work to do living in that, building that, keeping that going, but that won't be our work. Our work is this work of the transition of attempting to build the new institutions. Um, and that's a lot of experimentation. Um, uh, there's a, a paper I wrote, uh, uh, where I talk about the, 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 the best of the best and the first of the next, right? So the best of the best is the stuff that actually works really well in our existing institutions, but doesn't solve the problems of those institutions, just fixes them like mindfulness in schools. For example, there are incredible mindfulness in schools programs that really should be used, even though the whole school system itself is in terrible shape, like we should still have those kids meditating. Um, but the first of the next is truly innovative work, uh, that is again, attempting to build future institutions. And so a lot of our work in this transitional period is experimental, um, and prospective trying to think about what is actually viable for the future, not based on prior models. Um, so most people don't live in those periods. Like statistically, most people live in the periods of stable civilization all, you know, like Egypt was like thousands of years, basically the same civilization. <laughs> Our civilization has been about 600 depending or 400, depending on where you put it. Um, but now we're in this very, I believe it will be a pretty abrupt transitional period, which we are living in, which means that the things we do now will have a very profound impact. Um, on the future. And um, talking about this, this future after this state of flux, and as you mentioned, it's such a transition period with these catalysts like the climate, like AI. Well, do you have much hope for what comes next? Totally. I think you have to have hope. Um, I think you have to be. Uh, there's a way of having hope that is pre tragic, right? So it's like you use hope to get out of looking at how bad the situation actually is. Right? Um, uh, and then when you're in the tragedy, 
when you've got beyond the pre-tragic trend, you're looking at the tragedy, then there's no hope. That's the kind of the definition of like being in a tragedy. You feel like there's no hope, right? But there's what I would call a post-tragic, right? And the post-tragic means that you've looked at how bad it actually is, but you have actually come to peace with it and now work from a place of hope. Uh, and this is, I think, very important for the younger generations to get so much of the climate education and so much of the education around planetary problems is just demoralizing and scary uh, and tragic, basically. Uh, and so I'm saying, okay, that's okay. That's one. You have to look at that, but then you really have to get into a post tragic space pretty quickly. Um, uh, and the post tragic space isn't one where you believe that it'll all work out, <laughs> but it's one where you are committed to doing what can be done in your circle of influence with full integrity and full awareness and commitment to ongoing learning. So it's about, uh, taking responsibility, even in the face of a sense that things are, will be very difficult. <laughs> um, and then from that perspective, you realize like that, and this is some of the stuff that I mentioned with uh, the religiosity, that the universe is kind of in the business of solving really complex problems. I'm just gonna like, just note that. Like the creation of the human was pretty crazy. Like how did that happen, right? Like the universe did that. I didn't do that. I didn't make my own brain and my insides. I don't even know how that works, right? It's the most complex thing in the universe right here, me. Like, and who did it? I don't know. The universe did it, right? So the universe does pretty remarkable things. And if you look at the history of evolution, it actually has solved intractable problems before. Um, much of what we think of as evolution is actually a response to crisis. Uh, you know, the Cambrian explosion and other things being response to fundamental changes in kind of metabolic systems of using oxygen. Um, so the, the broad point here is that like, uh, yeah, we, we are not in a position to know, uh, kind of how this plays out. And this isn't me saying just have faith, but I'm saying that there's a great deal that is, uh, not accounted for in our current philosophies and science. Um, I think of the Shakespeare quote, right? That there's more in heaven of earth and more in heaven and earth than is dreamt of in your philosophy. Um, and so I think that stance of epistemic humility, which is saying like, we don't really know exactly what's going on. <laughs> like, yeah, this climate science is great, but the earth is way more complicated than you guys actually realize. And I'm not saying, therefore don't believe it. I'm saying, how does this work? <laughs> uh, so the epistemic humility is, it gets us out of that stance of simplistic problem solving and into a stance, which is like the left hemisphere, if you will, and into a stance of just like open awareness where you can start to realize what the work is for you to do in this place. Um, so yeah, I am hopeful. And I think we have a responsibility to have the post tragic hope and we have a responsibility not to just see it as a tragedy but we also have responsibility to see the tragedy of it, <laughs> right? So I'm saying you have to do all of that. You have to both have to get out of the pre-tragic hope. Uh, then you have to get out of the tragedy and into a position where you can take action. That's not reactive and actually hopeless action. That is strong, autonomous action from a position of, uh, from a position of some kind of trust in the human, some kind of trust in the universe. Um, which I think is warranted given the universe's performance thus far in creating the human, which is an incredible thing. Uh, so that's my answer there. I wanted to ask where you think the connection between mental health and this like uncertain time between worlds is because my parents are both teachers and they've been noticing as I have like an increase in kind of mental health issues or like turmoil in, in students and teachers alike. How do you think we can combat this or like, where is that connection? Yeah. The, the adolescent mental health crisis is probably the greatest sign of our failing educational system and not just the schools. 
education is everything that brings you into being an adult, the media, family, schools, all that stuff, that the majority of our adolescents are in a situation of mental health crisis. And it's not an exaggeration. Like the majority of adolescents are in a situation of feeling like they're in an impending mental health crisis. That's a sign that something is very fundamentally awry with the system. And I, um, that's why I, when I was talking about AI and the future of education, uh, I, th I think a lot, I think we, something very radical has to happen pretty soon to help the youth. Uh, and I think it's like kind of taking the schools apart, uh, and building something like a massively funded public works project. <laughs> like, and so this is a weird thing. So in the United States, this was done, it was called the civilian conservation core, um, which was, it employed ten, like millions and millions of people during the depression at a time when, uh, there was a complete sense of hopelessness, uh, and there was no opportunity. And that's why the hopelessness was there. And there was a sense that the world was coming apart and things needed to be fixed. And so the CCC said, okay, we'll give you a job and we'll give you an opportunity to fix things. <laughs> uh, there's nothing worse than sitting back with an open heart, looking at the world in turmoil and feeling like there's nothing you can do about it because you're trapped in a school that's forcing you to compete against other kids to get into college than to get what job, right? So it's a very demoralizing position to be in. Uh, and so, you know, one of the things we did with modernity was to separate the schools from employment. This is important. Like child labor laws are important, but at the same time, it means we've kept kids and adolescents in particular out of being in a position of contributing to their communities in ways the communities actually need. Uh, so what I'm saying is here, we actually need a very strong pivot out of the human capital theory of schooling, which just pushes us through this thing to get a job eventually and delays your ability to contribute to society until you are a full grown adult. And then maybe then you won't even right to a situation where we actively put young people in positions to assist their community at the local level in projects that actually need to be done. Uh, a little bit of a, resur a resurgence of like a guild model um, where Many of the organizations and businesses in the local area uh, collaborate with educational institutions to orchestrate internships and just get kids doing things. Like the number one thing I would tell someone who came to me with depression was go work in a soup kitchen. And it's just like scientifically proven <laughs> that if you do something where you are helping other people, you stop feeling depressed about yourself, especially if you're helping people who are actually worse off than you. Um, so I, I think the solution to, well, so there's that, get the kids doing things that they feel is meaningful, get them out of a situation of having to delay the time when they can contribute to society, get, have them contributing now, they will feel better. And the other thing is regulate these technologies. I'm holding up my cell phone here, regulate these technologies. These should be like class two substances in the United States. That means it's an illegal substance that you should not have access to unless you're over 18, let's say, you have the very, and even then this thing would be, because all the adults are addicted to these things too. So that's the other stance. I believe the adolescent mental health crisis is fueled by digital technology and specifically social media addiction. Uh, so that to me is just like, yeah, that's a legislative and technological responsibility question. And we know these things are bad for kids. We, we need to find a way to, to get them off of that. <laughs> so I think that would help a lot too. Um, Understandably, it's very relevant. Um, and to kind of wrap up, we were wondering, and this connects to the schooling system and us being students or <laughs> anything else really, um, do you have any questions for us? Oh, well. <laughs> Are you guys hopeful about the future? I don't think we can speak for everyone, but speaking for myself, yes. And I am hopeful. I think you can't really move forward or it's very difficult to um, proceed without hope. Because like you're saying, 
th then everything becomes a tragedy and tragedy often ends quite unfortunately and I think no progress will be made if there isn't some kind of hope because hope lives beyond the present moment it's it's in that same way it's like faith it kind of extends into what we don't yet know and so if we have hope for that then I think we're closer to achieving it than if we were to kind of stay in our little circles of doom if that makes sense but that's just speaking for me oh, that's a beautiful answer thank you from my perspective I don't think I used to because I, th I think I, I um, tended to look at what was happening in the world as something that I could directly influence in every way or that there was some kind of thing that I should be doing that I wasn't doing that could help our situation um, either like just the people around me or the world as a whole and then I started to kind of realize that everybody has a capacity for what they can do um, to help uh, what they can do to engage with the people around them and just kind of make the world a little bit of a better place and I figured that as long as I do that like we were talking about how the universe has like a amazing ability to, to do things and to sort things out I'm not saying leave everything to fate but I'm saying that in order to live a life where you're kind of at peace and you're you're happy you have to accept that there's some things that you can't do and that you can only do what you can and so I think that that's given me hope is that I think I've started noticing just how much the people around me are doing what they can and that gives me a lot of optimism I think for the world well thank you you guys are giving me hope so articulated and what young I'm like okay good <laughs> <laughs>